Welcome everyone to the first Iowa Bibliophiles of the school year. Typically, Margaret Gam, head of special collections, would be giving this introduction, but she really made the most out of Labor Day weekend, uh, giving birth to a bouncing baby boy on Saturday. And so while we are excited for her and the family, it means you're stuck with me, Liz Reardon, Outreach and Engagement Librarian. Today, we're welcoming Adam Weinberger as our first virtual Iowa Bibliophile speaker. For years now, we have intended to record bibliophile presentations, and COVID-19 has finally given us the real reason to do so. As a reminder, only the talk will be recorded, not the Q&A that follows. Margaret first encountered Adam back in 2014 as the rare book buyer of his website, rarebookbuyer.com. While he maintains this website, he is now more commonly known as simply Adam Weinberger Rare Books, a member of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America since 2017. He recently appeared in the 2020 documentary titled The Booksellers, which featured him and a number of other antiquarian booksellers in the New York area. Personally, Special Collections can speak to his ability to find books of interest to Iowa and to his on-point shipping and fancy wrapping skills, making every package seem like a birthday or holiday gift. We are excited to hear Adam's thoughts on the evolving world of book dealing. And so thank you, Adam, for uh, presenting today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. So I was going to uh, talk about uh, the, what I consider the emotional aspects of uh, being a rare book dealer, something I think that's not always discussed in the trade. Um, of course, for me, uh, you know, the rare book business is a very emotional one. You know, there's, you're always, um, the, the cold aspects, let's say, of being a merchant, you're buying and selling for profit. Uh, but for most dealers, uh, we're not trading in ordinary commodities. We're not dealing in apples and oranges. Uh, we're dealing in objects uh, with historical, literary, artistic importance. And we wouldn't be in this trade if we didn't have an intense passion and an emotional and intellectual connection uh, for their discovery, ownership and preservation. Uh, so this sometimes makes me think about the psychological profile of a dealer. And it sounds like, uh, you know, it's an episode or something from Law and Order, um, you know, like a bookseller who's committed some sort of crime. But, uh, you know, to be attracted to books uh, or manuscripts uh, requires, uh, I would say, a, a certain sensitivity, whether it's an artistic or historical sensitivity, to see what makes a book interesting, because you really have to spot the subtleties, whether it's an aspect of the binding, um, or you, know, you take a little piece of paper and you want to envision its place in the greater context of history. Uh, and that uh, sensitivity inevitably intrudes upon the personality of the bookseller. Uh, before I was a bookseller, I studied computer science at Berkeley, and one day a professor came to me and he messed up my uh, desk of pencils and pens and stuff. He says, computer science is a very precise science. You get very exact. Don't let it organize, don't let it intrude on yourself and organize your life, you know, because you'll become uh, too exact in life. And in some ways you take that sensitivity from the, uh, uh, your appreciation of books uh, and it does shape your actual personality. And uh, it's not just book dealers, I would say, uh, that, that are a highly emotionally charged group of people. Uh, it's also uh, the people who own books, uh, you know, the people who sell books, because um, uh, books have to come from somewhere. Uh, a lot of times they come from estates. Uh, perhaps a loved one has died. Uh, and these are the emotional aspects which are sometimes uh, like inextricably tied to the essence of that very person that they remember. So a lot of emotions involved. Uh, for me personally, in terms of buying, uh, I would say the most painful uh, emotional experience is the, the books you lose out on. Uh, that is sometimes only greater uh, than sometimes the books you actually get, which can cause you a lot of grief as well. Uh, so, uh, like I said, I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, through some examples of what I consider like a, the emotional roller coaster of, uh, you know, buying books, acquiring uh, material. 
so I'd start uh, with a book uh, that I did not get. Um, and this is a fresh wound, <laughs> not, it hasn't been cauterized even yet, uh, so I can talk from the heart on this. A uh, uh, couple weeks ago, I received a text, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll try and share the screen here uh, for the first text. I get a lot of texts coming in. Uh, I think you can see this. And uh, a woman showed me a whole bunch of books uh, on a shelf, uh, and I quickly look at everything, and I spied uh, among these dirty volumes here something that said uh, the uh, American Archive. So uh, on that shelf is a very beat-up volume of what's called Peter Force's American Archive from 1848. Uh, now, that is a volume, despite its rather uh, decrepit condition there, that contains a facsimile printing of the Declaration of Independence, which is very sought after uh, by collectors. Uh, and it has a very interesting history because, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, our, uh, essentially our national birth certificate, is in very poor shape. Uh, and in the 1820s, uh, it was already deteriorating and the ink was fading and they hired a man named uh, William J. Stone uh, to produce a copper plate facsimile copy, which he printed on vellum, uh, which is an extraordinarily expensive document. Uh, and some people criticize him even as uh, causing further damage uh, you know, to the document, which you can appreciate in special collections there through a, a wet transfer process. Uh, so this particular printing uh, was taken from that same copper plate. It was probably printed in the 1830s and it was inserted into an unsuccessful publication. Uh, it was unsubscribed. It wasn't finished uh, in the 1840s. Uh, but it still is valuable. So I saw that, I, I asked her to confirm that if it was in the book, and she was very surprised that she even had that in the book. So it was quite an interesting discovery. But I asked myself, uh, is this something I actually want to buy? Uh, because it's printed on a very cheap rice paper, unlike the beautiful stone printing on vellum. Uh, and it is a facsimile. And as a bookseller, we have this uh, innate repugnancy, you say the, uh, the word facsimile, you know, we want to, uh, it's after like eating a bad meal, basically. Uh, and it felt, it feels a little bit to me of, like a very commercial object, that my heart wasn't invested in it, because I imagine it's the type of thing uh, a wealthy lawyer would like, uh, you know, to stick up on the wall and say he has a, a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And as a bookseller, that's not exactly what I enjoy buying and selling necessarily, flashy objects. But as the night went on uh, that evening, I kept thinking about it, like you think about some things that offered, and the, I started to fall in love with it because I thought about the history of it. And those archives were really one of the earliest attempts uh, to uh, create uh, an archive of important documents in American history, the colonial uh, and federal period history, revolutionary period. Uh, and then she called me and said, oh, I'm, I thought she was in Connecticut. She said, actually, I'm just around the corner from you. So I went over to see it. And uh, when I went over to see uh, the volume in person, the declaration was in a very beautiful condition inside. And I don't know why, but it was suddenly transformed in my mind uh, from this uh, item that I debated whether I even wanted to something that I just fell in love with. It was a must have uh, object of uh, you know, beauty and reverence. And I tried to make uh, what I considered a uh, reasonable offer from it. And I felt like it was the type of thing I should be able to buy since I was the one who honestly, uh, you know, pointed it out to her. And she uh, otherwise was, uh, you know, I don't know what she was going to do with the books, but a lot of the books get tossed sometimes otherwise. Uh, and I, I made her an offer and she told me, well, she wanted another bookseller. She had contacted the previous night after I told her about it, was also interested in it. Uh, and he was also interested in a, a volume of Teddy Roosevelt she had. And I immediately, uh, you know, go through the Rolodex in my head of who my competition is and what they will offer. Uh, so the only thing I could do is extract a promise from her uh, that uh, since I pointed it out to her, at least she'd give me a shot at making a counteroffer. 
uh, you know, that would equal or be better uh, than the other offer. And I followed that up closely uh, and uh, two days uh, later uh, to see what happened. And it had already been consigned to auction. So I never got a shot in it. I didn't feel the promise that I was kept. And you do feel a lot of that emotional uh, and intellectual energy uh, you pour into something. It's very disappointing uh, when you don't get something, uh, you know, you really have your heart set on for whatever reason. So uh, that is uh, one experience of a book uh, I did not get. Uh, then on the flip side, of course, uh, you have a lot of emotions attached to things, even uh, when you get them. Uh, as an example of that, uh, maybe uh, seven or eight years ago, I think it was at Bonham's an auction, I purchased a uh, Bible uh, that belonged to Alan Turing, uh, the father of uh, computer science, the Turing machine, uh, and he was uh, uh, famously persecuted for his uh, homosexuality, um, and it was reputed, you know, he uh, killed himself or committed suicide with a, a half-eaten apple laced with cyanide, uh, like uh, Snow White, uh, something to that effect. Uh, and I can show you a picture of the Bible here. Let me uh, click this. Yeah, so this was a picture of the inscription. Uh, you can see at the bottom, it just says, Alan, Christmas 1938, and it was written uh, to his mother, uh, a very bare bones inscription. And uh, it was a uh, rather unassuming uh, little uh, volume. I mean, that's what uh, booksellers, if you have to catalog it, might describe it euphemistically. Uh, I think if you described it in the language of Ghostbusters, you might say it's something like that little ugly spud. Um, but it had a lot of appeal to me because this particular Bible was given uh, in the year, and I came from a computer science background, so I particularly was attracted to it. But the Bible was given in the year 1938 or 1939 when uh, Turing uh, was on a King's College Fellowship. Uh, you know, he was a logician at the time, a number theorist, uh, and it was before he had taken up uh, his vital work uh, in cryptanalysis uh, at Bletchley Park for the war. And the Bible really spoke to me because uh, it was like the intersection of his atheism and his upbringing. Uh, and you tie that in all together with a lot of these uh, biblical admonitions against homosexuality uh, that were a large part of uh, uh, English culture at the time. Uh, and you wonder why he still uh, you know, decided to give this Bible as a gift. Uh, and it was just a small object, uh, a unique object for a lot of reflection on all those various uh, cultural intersections. And a uh, few Bibles ever come to market really uh, with these tangible links uh, you know, to great men of science who are often atheists or have uh, uh, you know, nonconformist religious beliefs. Um, there was a Bible shortly thereafter, I think, uh, also like a Gideon Bible uh, uh, that belonged to Einstein that got a very uh, large sum of money. And, uh, I, you know, I went about, I bought the Bible, I forgot how much it was, uh, maybe eight or nine thousand dollars. And uh, I wrote up, you know, what I considered a nice uh, description. Uh, I used to have a, a professor at Oxford when I did a year abroad, uh, always give me backhanded compliments. He said, my, my writing sometimes bordered on eloquence. So I, I don't know what to say about that, but uh, I tried one of those descriptions that bordered on eloquence. Uh, and I took it to fairs and I, uh, sh uh, you know, I offered it to institutions and I was rejected. Uh, nobody wanted the book, despite uh, my salesmanship. Uh, and as I took it around, a lot of people said in the field, well, you know, the reason they did not want it is it's, you know, outside of the collecting interests of most of the people who appreciate Turing. It just, you know, they want his seminal works on computer machinery and intelligence, uh, but they don't want a Bible that he gave to his mother. And you find that personally very depressing, uh, you know, when you you find something uh, and, you know, it's like uh, I have a daughter, so they say, you know, your daughter is not the most uh, talented flautist in the school or something. Any insult you take extremely personally when you think you have something. 
Uh, and so, you know, with uh, ever present uh, cash flow considerations when you're in business, I, I sold it, uh, I think, almost uh, for no profit. And I'm sure it was sold on, you know, for a considerable sum after that. But I, it's one of those books that I still regret. <laughs> you know, I still feel uh, the pang of regret from selling that. And I know they say, uh, you know, in life, you're not supposed to have regrets. Uh, you know, whether it's a, a lost love or that, you know, your uh, past mistakes always, uh, you know, forge your future path. Uh, but I'm, I would say I'm not so sure that applies, uh, you know, to rare books, uh, especially ones that I've underpriced uh, and sold. So some emotional pangs uh, there from a uh, book that I actually bought. Uh, some other emotional aspects of the business I find, you know, in terms of buying books, what to pay, uh, you know, as an example, um, you know, you certainly can pay too little for a book. Uh, and uh, I suppose, uh, you know, in this business, uh, you know, there are people who try uh, to buy as cheaply as they can, and they sell it as uh, for much as they can, you know, without any pangs of conscience. Uh, I don't personally feel like that, you know. Uh, you know, in the ABAA, the organization, you know, we have a code of written ethics, which, uh, you know, compels us or to conduct our business, uh, you know, with fairness uh, and integrity. Uh, but there's always uh, the question of what is fairness? Uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily get talked about. You know, if a book is worth uh, $10,000 and one pays 5000 for it, you know, is that fair, uh, you know, to double your money, it, you know, it depends, I guess, who you bought it from and other questions like that. Uh, and of course, you know, there's the grander scheme uh, of profit margins and the expenses of running a business. And there are all sorts of hidden costs, you know, uh, perhaps the greatest hidden course is the unsold inventory, you know, that you have to keep on the shelves, which naturally uh, erodes profit and consumes capital. Uh, but as to a, a specific example uh, that I thought about, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I was offered uh, and purchased an, a sermon of Cotton Mather, uh, the famous New England Puritan, uh, you know, famous for his involvement uh, with the Salem witch trials. Uh, this particular sermon was uh, particularly uncommon. Uh, and there were no uh, recent auction records on which to base, you know, a, a fair offer. Uh, and on top of that, one of the reasons I was interested in it is it bore the signature of uh, Joseph Seawall, who had uh, early connections to Harvard University Library and Harvard University itself. He uh, turned down the presidency and he had donated many books to the library. So very nice early American provenance. Uh, and I offered uh, $2,500 for it, and it was accepted, happily accepted. And again, I cataloged it, and I offered it for $5,000, you know, looking to double my money to a few institutions, uh, you know, did not sell in a catalog. Uh, and you, again, you get a little bit uh, dejected, you know, you're building up your, uh, you know, your unsold inventory, and the books you love uh, quickly lose their appeal in your eyes you know, if they sit around uh, too long on the shelves. So, uh, you know, again, uh, in consideration of cash flow, I put it into auction uh, where uh, for whatever uh, reasons that particular day, it, it got a rather remarkable price of $15,000. Uh, so here I was, uh, you know, sitting on what is essentially a sevenfold profit. Uh, and the woman who sold it for me was a private woman. She received it from her mother, rather delightful woman. Uh, and you don't want to feel necessarily that you cheated somebody. Uh, so I sort of debated in my head whether I should give her a call and pay her more, uh, you know, explain the situation. But it is a very tricky situation. And as soon as you go about doing that, uh, you immediately open up a can of worms. Uh, so you have to struggle with that. Is that something you actually want to even get involved with or just keep your mouth shut? Uh, and of course, I actually had other books in the auction that day. Some didn't do very well. One sold for uh, you know, less than I paid for it. So nobody's going to compensate you for those losses. 
Uh, so I debated over the next couple of days of what I should say to her and uh, maybe compensate or something. And then out of the blue, I got a call from her uh, and she had noticed the auction. Uh, she had uh, diligently monitored it, you know, and saw uh, the final price online, uh, one of the problems of the transparency of Google these uh, days. Uh, you know, and especially it looked uh, egregious because the auction house publishes it with its additional 25% and people don't realize that's not money in your pocket necessarily. So she was, of course, uh, quite furious, uh, you know, uh, with, the, with the situation. And then the situation sort of went in my mind, you know, from here I am thinking, oh, I, I willingly want to offer her some compensation, you know, as, as, as a goodwill gesture, to now uh, being rather, I would say, almost obnoxiously told uh, what to do and demanded. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's a human emotion, you know, to recoil, I would say, you know, once something is demanded from you rather than coming willingly. Uh, and I did resolve the situation. I, I, I think I explained things professionally as best as I could and I paid her money. Uh, but uh, it is an emotional situation, those things that weigh on me when I'm buying and selling in, this, in terms of fairness. And that one example is not a singular example. It's a part of a continual trend, a persistent and larger question really in all of these transactions, because I buy a lot of books privately. Uh, and it's, it's a difficult balance, at least for me. I don't know if all booksellers feel it. Uh, you know, you certainly could be cold about it uh, in terms of what is fair and, you know, uh, you know, what to pay, because we essentially are merchants, uh, but we're a little bit under the guise of uh, academics, but we're not true, you know, uh, academics in that sense. So that's a situation of paying too little, uh, you know, for a book that has to be resolved. Uh, then, of course, there is the flip side of the situation, paying too much, <laughs> you know, for a book, which is uh, not uncommon, uh, you know, despite uh, no matter how many years of experience, again, you get emotionally charged with these things. Uh, one of the most uh, common ways is, of course, at auction. And naturally, uh, as you saw in the booksellers with uh, Nick Lowry speaking, uh, uh, the auction houses thrive on stoking all of those competitive juices. You know, and I'm certainly guilty of waving my hand uh, many times against my better senses. Uh, and sometimes it's not even for a book you want. You sort of get an emotional fatigue uh, going to an auction and sitting there for hours, especially if you're in the room and you see uh, books falling to other bidders now on the internet. Nick said it uh, once very well. He said, uh, I was at a swan auction. He said, oh, it's nice to see the six of you here. You're bidding against yourselves and the entire world. <laughs> so if you don't get what you want, uh, this fatigue sets in, you start to bid on things you don't want. And before you know, you have a bill and a pile of stuff and you question uh, repeatedly why you do that until the next time you repeat the mistake. Uh, and this also happens uh, privately uh, many times as well. Uh, you know, you drive and you travel somewhere and you invest a lot of time. Um, you know, uh, uh, a number of years ago, for instance, I got a call and I drove down to uh, Virginia uh, to uh, examine a collection and usually, uh, you know, I like to give free appraisals and everything, but if I'm going to have to drive very far and put a lot of time, I try and make it clear that it's not a free appraisal, that I'm coming with my intention is to buy. You don't have an obligation, of course, but uh, I like to, you know, uh, set the stage of reasonable expectations. Uh, and the woman who had owned the house, she had inherited uh, a collection built uh, since the early 19th century. Uh, including from uh, uh, some of her great, great, great grandparents were uh, benefactors to the Smithsonian Museum. Uh, and the house had many, many wonderful objects of interest. Uh, it even had uh, a, a dog house that was carved in about 1820, the most beautiful elaborate dog house I've ever seen. And I think the, the passion that fuels, you know, a lust for books can also sometimes fuel a lust for extraneous objects. And I fell in love with that dog house, even though I don't have a dog. <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing that I wanted there. Uh, and the basement of this house was just brimming uh, with old books. 
the problem uh, was that the owner, uh, you know, again, she was quite an intelligent, a lovely person, but she was not an experienced seller. Uh, and she was very nervous uh, on one hand uh, about prices and things. Uh, and secondly, she had a deep attachment for the books that came for, through her family now close to 200 years. Uh, and she had no uh, proper appreciation for the book market itself, uh, especially uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that many old books have very little value. Not everything that's old is gold, uh, they say. Uh, and I just could not get any uh, uh, a transaction going in this case. Uh, and one of the things I made a fatal mistake is she showed me uh, a set of Audubon, uh, the octavo edition of The Beautiful Birds. The bindings were rather shot and the plates were heavily foxed. And if you're a collector of plate books, that's the last thing you could ever possibly want. Um, and I made her an offer, uh, which I can say only was uh, a relatively low offer. You know, the set can get thirty, forty thousand dollars sometimes quite easily. And I think I offered her eight or nine thousand unwillingly because it wasn't even a set I wanted because I can't sell it like that. I was just desperate to get something going. Uh, and she had looked it up online and she saw, you know, Donald Heald, uh, the great dealer in New York, had a set listed for 60,000 and you know, that has certainly soured her mood uh, that this uh, uh, cheapo had entered her premises, <laughs> you know, which was not my intention at all. Uh, you know, and then I, I, that wasn't successful, so I let that pass and thankfully didn't buy that. Uh, and I went down uh, into the basement and it was steamer trunks and boxes of, of books that were very hard to access and lots of work uh, and mostly minor material but still interesting preserved and original boards and things like that. So that sort of sets the heart of flutter when you're a bookseller. And I put together a box after many hours and I offered her a, a, a reasonable sum for it. I thought, I don't remember how much, but uh, uh, that was also rejected. Uh, and I just wanted to get something going. I'm gonna share a screen here again, a new share. So I gotta uh, click on this. So finally, I convinced her to uh, sell to me uh, a Chinese album uh, she had of uh, Chinese courtesans that were painted on pith paper, uh, like a rice-like paper. This was done in like the 1840s, but they're extremely fragile. Uh, and I think I paid her three or $4,000 for it. Uh, they were charming. And I also uh, bought from her, uh, I'll do the stop share here, uh, for uh, whatever reason, here we go. I threw in an old master painting, uh, which is, this is what looked to me at the time as a uh, copy of uh, uh, what's known as the Madonna of the Pinks after uh, Raphael. And I paid her another $3,000 for that. And it was all to get the ball moving, uh, you know, in some sort of transaction. And after I left with those two objects, I driving back, you know, the hours and hours drive, I literally questioned, uh, you know, my sanity, uh, because here I was, uh, you know, throwing good money after bad, a lot of time invested, and I was leaving with a Chinese album in poor condition and a fake painting. Uh, and on top of it, you know, the next day, uh, I got a call from the woman and she wanted that Chinese album back. It was very important for her. You know, she felt I severely underpaid for it. And I was willing, I said, to give both items back. Uh, the truth is I was, would have given just the Chinese album back, but for whatever mood I was in at that moment, I, I wanted to undo the entire transaction and she did not want both back. Uh, so I did not return just uh, the one, even though, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, I would say the emotional drain of it all clouded, uh, you know, my uh, better uh, uh, business judgment, basically. So uh, then, of course, uh, you know, on the very positive side, because I don't want to inject only negative <laughs> emotions into things, uh, you know, one of the great uh, uh, emotional things you can experience is this incredible rush of adrenaline uh, you know, you get uh, with uh, discovery. Uh, and uh, as an example of that, uh, which uh, is infrequent, unfortunately, but we, uh, we savor every moment that happens, 
uh, I have a, a, a well-known art dealer friend in New York City, uh, and he gets a lot of connections, and he uh, is a little flamboyant, and he got a call from a house uh, in New Jersey that evidently was just packed to the gills. I mean, you could open the door and you could not enter uh, that house, not only with books, but antiques and every object you could possibly imagine. And he bought uh, the entire contents of the house, uh, just barely opening the door. Uh, I think he paid something on the order of half a million or $600,000 for that. Uh, and then he could not enter the house. He did not know uh, what was inside. Uh, he uh, likes to take big chances like that on instinct. Uh, and then he decided he's going to uh, parcel it out to other antique dealers that he's known over the years and trust him and say, you know, you take the foyer for 50,000, you know, the kitchen's 25,000, the bathroom's five, <laughs> you know, and he quickly recouped uh, most of his money. Uh, and since I'm not in the painting and antique business, I was a little bit late in the game. And he said, oh, the, the basement's uh, filled with books. Uh, do, you know, do you want that you know, for, for 80 or $90,000? They said, well, can I see? No, you can't see it. He, that's his rules. He likes everything fair. He says, you got to take the basement or, or you're not going to. And I wasn't going to shell out that type of money uh, completely sight unseen you know, for, uh, you know, I have to think of my daughters. <laughs> Uh, so he, but he's still a, a good friend and he, he's a fun spirit. He said, I'll tell you what, he says, you know, for uh, $15,000, you go down there, you know, uh, 30 minutes or an hour or whatever it was, you take up whatever you want, but you only can stay that, that period of time. I said, fine. Uh, so I entered that basement, not knowing, you know, what was uh, in the basement. Uh, and but just having a sense from the quality of the antiques and antiquities and other objects that were around the house. Uh, and sure enough, it was, I mean, it was so much where you were really impenetrable. There was so much stuff. Uh, but, you know, you develop a sense uh, as a bookseller right away, you know, uh, where to look among the piles. And I probably pulled out of there, you know, a dozen uh, incunables, uh, there were lots of early Bibles, uh, some really fascinating uh, material that uh, probably had not seen. You know, a lot of the, uh, the things he bought were in the early 1980s. Uh, and as I was going through it, it actually came from a, a professor at NYU who had passed away. Uh, and the strange thing was, is uh, he had been a friend of my father when I was young. So my father knew him and he had even bought things from him once I saw his name. And I had sold him myself things, uh, you know, uh, uh, long before I passed. One of the things I regretted selling was even a, a very early Quran, which went up in value tremendously. It was like a, it was a fragment of a Quran from like the 11th century. And uh, over the years, uh, those have gone up in value. So I said, oh, I've got to find <laughs> that, that fragment here somewhere. But uh, I did not find that in the allotted time. And, uh, uh, one of the other dealers uh, did indeed buy uh, the rest of the, the room and, you know, put things in auction or took them wherever they did. He wasn't a book dealer, uh, but there were other things down there as well. Pre-Columbian material, Egyptian artifacts, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, it was, uh, but you have that uh, amazing, uh, you know, rush of adrenaline and excitement when you, you know, find, uh, you know, uh, some things uh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those are some emotional experiences, uh, you know, the different, not the full gamut, but certainly a range, uh, you know, from the negative to the positive of what you feel, uh, you know, as a, a bookseller. And I'll show a few objects here. Uh, I pick these out uh, because you also, besides the experience of buying and selling, you do get a lot of emotions, at least I do, attached to certain objects and always questioning you know, your business senses, uh, you know, versus uh, your heart in these matters. Uh, so you can see me what I show on screen here. So this was, I'll start off, uh, one of the things I got from that basement in New York. I don't know if you can see it here. I'll unwrap it. It's, uh, I'll show it to the screen. I guess you guys can see that, right? So I'll, I'll take it to the camera. And this was in a little folder down there. Uh, and it said that it was uh, fifth to sixth century and it had a photo of the professor. And at one time it had been framed in his office uh, as one of his like prized possessions. 
uh, and I've never been able to figure out what it is. I've consulted uh, uh, various paleographers, the British Library. Uh, no one has been able to tell me. It certainly has uh, the feel of authenticity, uh, but the language uh, is uh, unknown, basically. Some people have said it might be South Arabian, it have, might have some Coptic influences, it's probably religious. I don't know if you can see the little diagrams of the funny uh, creatures there. Uh, so uh, it's always been a question, uh, it's a little bit like the Voynich manuscript uh, of this mysterious lost language that nobody can uh, read. And of course, when nobody knows what the language is, even though uh, there have been lost languages like at the monastery, uh, the St. Katharina Monastery in the Sinai, uh, there are always discoveries of languages there that are known in only one or two copies or things that have faded. Uh, so it certainly could be uh, the unique, the last survivor of a lost language, which to me has, uh, you know, unbelievable historic importance. Uh, on the flip side, it could be a complete fake. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, you know, there were certainly lots of fakes being made. There's a wonderful exhibit, I think Mark Jones did at the British Museum uh, in a book showing all types of fakes. Uh, even that appeals to me because uh, that 19th century antiquarianism and why you would go about uh, making a parchment in a language, uh, I find intellectually interesting. Uh, but I am a bookseller <laughs> and I, I have to think about selling material, not keeping material. I've purposely separated myself as a collector uh, and I keep hanging on to this, uh, you know, probably because I can't guarantee what it is. Uh, and when you can't guarantee something, you either have to sell it as is uh, at a very, rather cheap price. Uh, um, but I've developed also an emotional attachment to it because it came from the house and it's a nice memory. And that's always a challenge, you know, when you love the things you're selling, uh, deciding, you know, whether to hang on to them or to actually sell them. So uh, that's one object. Uh, another object, and again, these always are become difficult things to sell. I'll, it's a little book here and I'll take some of the leaves out. And I'll show you some of the leaves here. You can see of various uh, German coats of arms uh, from the 16th century. And some of them are extremely beautiful with unicorns and, and gilding and everything. And, what I assume that these are is, uh, these are probably uh, the colorful plates taken from what we call an album Amicorum, uh, which was a friendship album, uh, very popular, uh, you know, from the, in the 16th and 17th centuries. And at some point, probably uh, somebody separated the more beautiful leaves uh, and had them put in this, uh, you know, uh, rambotage, a, a case uh, of, uh, you know, using old materials from the 19th century. Uh, and again, it's one of those things I just love. I love the uh, beautiful armorials. Uh, uh, you know, they really speak to me. Anything with animals I get personally attached to. And it's, I have trouble assigning a price to it because, you know, I think in my mind, it's just a fragment of a book. And if I'm going to honestly sell it, I'd have to describe it like that. I could never charge what I consider an unfair price. Uh, but again, it's that problem of being a bookseller, getting attached to things, uh, and then they start to pile up uh, on your shelves. And as Arthur pointed out at the beginning of the, of the program, uh, I tend not to list them online. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, another thing that I, I personally really like and I buy whenever I can find are, are these little letters. Uh, this is a, a 16th century uh, letter here, and I can open up. And I was uh, reading a book uh, with my daughter the other day. Uh, it was published uh, by Hallmark uh, in the 1970s, so not a great publisher, but it was a lovely book and it was called uh, The Letter in Painting. So paintings throughout the centuries, uh, whether it was Vermeer or Rembrandt, that highlighted a letter in it. And one of the things that was interesting about that was the very reason uh, I collect this is uh, letters were extraordinary objects to send uh, prior to the development of the postal system. It took tremendous effort, you know, to find a courier and expense to make sure it was going to the proper destination. 
So very few people sent personal letters. So, and uh, they're very hard to, to survive. So whenever I find a very early personal letter, I think uh, they're particularly interesting in terms of scholarship. Uh, this one in particular appeals to me. This was written uh, to the Corsini family. I don't know if you can see that in London in the 1580s, a famous Italian family uh, that was supplanted after the Medicis came to power, but they retained uh, their influence in London and their banking positions. Uh, they developed one of the earliest uh, and most successful private uh, postal systems. This was sent between Antwerp and London, uh, but they could get a message all over Europe uh, within three days, uh, which was quite remarkable for a private system of the period. Uh, and what I like about this particular letter, uh, one of the reasons I showed and hung on to it, it's uh, concerning the delivery of textiles and books. So somebody it probably accompanied a, a, a shipment coming from Antwerp uh, to London. And I think that also speaks uh, you know, to the continental book trade and interesting. The reason that I talk about the attachment to it is it's the sort of thing that falls between the cracks in the, in the rare book world. I have trouble getting people to appreciate what I see in these things. And it's always frustrating uh, because it's really, uh, it's both an object of Philatelli and stamp collectors might have an interest in it. Uh, but even then it's not a traditional type of object that they uh, collect. Uh, it's not a historical autograph necessarily because it's not extremely famous as a personal letter or somebody and it's not really a book. Uh, so it's very difficult to find uh, an appropriate market for that. And I find that, you know, I get irritated, <laughs> you know, never knowing what to do with things for which I have uh, personal enthusiasm, uh, but have, uh, you know, hard trouble, uh, you know, making into uh, placing with libraries or, or getting any commercial gain or appreciation for them. So. Uh, so those are three objects, again, uh, not only objects uh, for the trade and business, but with things which I interact emotionally with, which shape, you know, how I sell things. So those are, you know, basically some of the uh, emotional aspects. And if you guys have any questions, let me know.